Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST. Uh, with new recipes out over on my YouTube channel every Friday. So today we're doing a recipe from the YouTube channel that came out uh, last Friday, so last week. Uh, which is for a tempura fried sweet and sour chicken. Uh, which is not one that I have gotten in the habit of doing very often because I'm not generally a fan of big fan of sweets, like super, super sweet Chinese food. But uh, uh, we're going to take a shot at this one today and it's actually become one of my favorite ones uh, to do of late. Uh, because it has a couple of interesting additions that I have only ever come across in like Chinese, Americanized Chinese food. Uh, including, and more specifically, I think the thing that pops out to me the most uh, is going to be the use of pineapple syrup. Which, if you've never used pineapple syrup, uh, I wouldn't blame you because it comes up. Uh, most commonly, you probably see pineapple syrup appear in some drink. Uh, recipes, uh, but most often when you see those, you see pineapple syrup, it's probably coming up in a lot of drink recipes and cocktails that were like really popular in like the 50s and 60s, so they're like excessively sweet. Um, so uh, if you are into cocktail mixing, uh, you can actually get that pineapple syrup uh, uh, on its own, so you can just buy that stuff canned. Sometimes you might even be able to buy it jarred. Uh, and I actually don't know exactly what is in the pineapple syrup. I know it has some sort of essence of pineapple. Uh, with some other stuff, mostly I'm pretty sure is sugar and water. Uh, but what would I generally, uh, where I generally associate finding pineapple syrup, uh, is it's the syrup uh, that canned pineapple is canned in. So whenever you come across pineapple uh, that you've purchased and is in a can, uh, it's usually soaking in some kind of liquid. That's what we refer to as pineapple syrup. Also, this garlic is messy. Uh, so this is what we're going to be using today is some canned pineapple. Uh, if you're trying to reproduce this yourself, what we're looking for uh, is canned pineapple, but we're looking for the stuff that is canned in syrup. So if you shake it, you can hear the water sloshing around. That's the pineapple syrup. It's probably the most important ingredient, probably next to the ketchup that we're going to use. Uh, maybe the second most important ingredient to this entire dish is that pineapple syrup. So. Uh, so, if you're trying to reproduce this one yourself, definitely find your way over to the YouTube channel. Uh, lots of fun new stuff coming up over there every Friday. So, last Friday we came out with the recipe for this uh, sweet and sour chicken. Uh, Friday before that was a recipe for broccoli beef. We did another stir fry um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think we did uh, Chinese crepes or jam bean, which is really fun. So, uh, lots of fun like stuff like that uh, popping up over on the YouTube channel. So, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, find your way over and check out what's going on. Lots of fun new content every Friday. Okay, so kicking things off, I'm starting off with the same thing that starts most of our stir fries off. This is four cloves of crushed and minced garlic. Uh, you will notice that that was probably technically more than four cloves. I think that was closer to like five or six cloves. Uh, but the reason that it's five or six cloves is because we're nearing the end or that was the end of that particular bulb of garlic. Uh, and what you'll find when you get to the end of a bulb of garlic is that it has a bunch of smaller, uh, less substantial pieces of garlic or cloves of garlic that live in there. Uh, and I've kind of gotten in the habit of just tossing those uh, because they're annoying and difficult to chop uh, and just sort of get in the way. But uh, uh, if you're trying not to be wasteful, uh, chop that stuff up. Uh, next up, but this is moving on. Next up, this is uh, about an inch or about one tablespoon's worth of ginger here, which. Uh, if your ginger is really old, and this ginger is particularly old, I think this ginger is coming up on like a month and a half old. <laughs> it's really old ginger. Uh, ginger is fairly shelf stable. It's not going to go bad uh, anytime soon. Uh, the only time that I do recommend throwing ginger out is when it starts molding. That's probably a bad sign. Uh, but otherwise, other than that, it's probably going to be pretty shelf stable. I usually just keep this stuff in the pantry. Um, uh, and, but the problem is with ginger, as, uh, as I mentioned this a lot, uh, is that as it gets older, that skin, so the exterior skin of your ginger, uh, it starts drying out. So if you have really, really fresh ginger, like the stuff that you just got at the market today, um, it will be very, very moist. So it has like, basically it looks like it just came out of a bucket of water because it probably literally just came out of the soil. Um, uh, as it gets older, that stuff, it starts drying out. And then once it starts drying out, it's not really um, a great thing to put into your dish. It's still edible. It's not a big deal if you don't peel your ginger. Um, but it gets a little bit chewy. So in my opinion, uh, when when my, girl, my ginger is a little bit older, like this one, uh, I definitely go through the trouble of making sure to peel it. But when it's really, really fresh, though, you might often see me uh, just skip the peel uh, and then just toss it right in. 
uh, because it's not going to be nearly as chewy when it's fresh. So that's our garlic and ginger. Uh, we're going to set those aside and they're going to be the very first two things that get into our wok fry. Uh, next up, this is going to be half of a, this should have been half of a medium white onion. This is probably going to be half of a very large white onion, which should be okay, I guess. Uh, what we're going to do is do a large dice on this onion. So uh, we've done large dices on this onions before, uh, but we're going to take a specific look at how we're going to dice this onion. So you've noticed that I just chopped it in half. Uh, but when I chopped it in half, I left two things intact. So this root end right here, you can kind of see it. Here's our root end right here. Uh, and here's our stem end up top. So when we do our dice, uh, this is not true. So if you're doing a slice, uh, if you're trying to do slices on an onion, the first thing that you want to do is remove both that root and the stem. Uh, if we're going to do a dice, the first thing we want to do is remove this stem uh, and then peel our, our onion. Uh, and then what's going to happen, so you can even see it uh, holding the skin on as we're peeling the onion, uh, is we're going to leave that root end on and it's going to hold the rest of the onion together. Uh, so as we do our large dice, we're going to go slices down the center. I'm going to go one down the middle here. Uh, and then still the root end still attached. And then we're going to go downward. Uh, and chop our onion up. Uh, and then essentially what I'm doing is just chopping right around that root end. And here's my root, saved it for very last, and we're going to toss that. Uh, and that will give us this nice, large, evenly chopped dice. So what's happening is that root end, it's basically holding the onion together uh, as you do your dice so that you don't end up with um, pieces of onion flying around, which is not super fun. So this is our onion. We're going to set this aside. Uh, this is also going to be probably the single most fragile thing in our entire stir fry today. Uh, so when we do wok fry this, it's not going to be for very long. It's probably only going to be in the wok for uh, about a minute, maybe two minutes at most. Okay, so next up, this is a bit of celery. So in the original recipe that I had done, uh, which came out over on the YouTube channel, uh, I believe I used a red bell pepper, um, which is, in my opinion, probably better than the use of celery. Uh, but I was at the market today and could not locate uh, a decent looking red bell pepper or any decent looking bell pepper at all. Uh, the best I could find was some very, very questionable, most likely rotten uh, bell peppers. So uh, we're going to go with some celery that I have in the fridge, which is also a little bit questionable, but not quite as questionable. So uh, if you happen to be yourself low on or low or unavailable on fresh, uh, fresh veggies to use in your stir fry, uh, I love keeping a little bit of celery on hand um, because it's very it's a very useful and very convenient uh, filler vegetable. So uh, also, I also frequently keep this stuff on hand for any kind of like Italian cooking that I do. Uh, so like bolognese and stuff like that, any kind of lasagnas, anything uh, that requires a sofrito, I'm probably going to use some kind of celery in that. Uh, but in addition to that though, it is also a useful veggie to keep on hand uh, for any kind of uh, stir fry that uh, requires a veggie, uh, but you don't have the veggie that's on hand. So I use this stuff in Kung Pao chicken all the time, uh, or uh, any any kind of uh, stir fry that uh, uses a veggie and I didn't remember or could not get my hands on uh, something that was fresh. So really great uh, filler veggie. Uh, and then what, what I just did, so you'll notice that what we just did, uh, is I snapped it in half. So this is very important with celery. So celery has uh, all of these stringy membranes that are running in this direction. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not careful about it, uh, that stuff gets really, really chewy. So if you've ever had like celery sticks, uh, in the, it has like this really, really chewy, uh, almost stringy texture. Uh, that's coming from all of these stringy membranes. So what we want to do uh, when we use celery is snap it in half, uh, and that's going to expose all of these strings. Uh, and then what we want to do is just peel all of that stuff off as best as you can. So uh, you're not never going to get all of them off, uh, but do your best to get uh, as much of them off as possible, and that's going to keep it from getting... Uh, particularly like chewy or borderline inedible. Uh, for my celery, I'm going for fairly large slices here. Uh, the main reason that we're going for large slices is because celery, just like our onion, uh, is a pretty delicate vegetable. So if we're not careful, 
uh, it could completely disintegrate. So if you've ever used celery in a sofrito for like a bolognese or any kind of red sauce or meat sauce, uh, you'll be familiar with this where that celery, uh, essentially what you're doing is that's the basis of the sauce. So if you uh, fry it or like long cook it for long enough, it, basically what's going to happen is it's just going to start releasing that water. Uh, and then it's basically going to disappear. So it's going to disappear into uh, what uh, goes on to be like the core root of your stir of, of your sauce, of your bolognese, right? Um, so if you use that, uh, that same uh, concept is going to apply to your stir fries. Uh, if you throw that celery in and go, if it goes for too long in your wok fry, especially if it's chopped very, very small, uh, it's just going to give up all of its water and then it's going to disappear and you're not going to have anything in your wok fry. Uh, just like our onion. Nate, yeah, how's it going? Hello. Cool. Let's see, are we doing a marinade? We are doing a marinade. Let's get to our chicken next. Yeah, hello. What's going on? What's cooking? Yeah, today we're doing ooh, uh, we're doing a sweet and sour chicken, which we're going to do with a tempura batter, uh, which is one of my favorites of late. Uh, today I'm going to be doing this, I believe, in the original recipe I did it with chicken thigh. Uh, and I also think that the reason that I did it with chicken thigh was pretty much just because chicken thigh happened to have been defrosted the day that I did that dish. Uh, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference uh, either way if you use chicken thigh. Today we're using chicken breast uh, because I happen to have some chicken breast that I want to use up. Uh, but it's not going to make a much, much of a difference either way. So if you got chicken thigh, uh, the main difference being is that that chicken thigh, first of all, comes from dark meat. Uh, which might mean that it's a little bit more flavorful, but that, that's not really going to be a factor. Uh, the, the main factor that's going to come into play is that chicken thigh uh, has a lot more fat to it. So that fat, uh, when we're stir frying stuff, is particularly useful because you can develop thick sauces with that extra fat that renders. Uh, with a deep fry like what we're doing today, I don't think that it's actually going to make that much of a difference at all. Um, because everything is just going to be deep fried anyway, so you're not going to be able to taste anything uh, that's significantly different just because you have more fat in your chicken so uh, today we're using chicken breast uh, you could also use chicken thigh it would pretty much taste the same uh, what's more important a lot more important than the cut of chicken uh, is how we chop the chicken so what you'll notice we're doing here uh, is I'm being very careful I'm not just going uh, uh, crazy and just chopping all this stuff straight ahead. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that all of my chicken is chopped uh, as close to evenly sized pieces as possible. So we want these all to be uh, relatively uniform in size. This is almost always going to be true anytime that you're chopping, but really, really important when we're deep frying uh, like we are today. Uh, because uh, we're not going to have, you can't, you're not really going to be able to see what's going on in the fryer. Uh, so if you're not careful, if these are sized differently, uh, what you're going to end up with is like some burnt pieces of chicken, some undercooked pieces of chicken. Things are just going to generally just start cooking unevenly uh, all over the place. So we want to try and avoid that from happening uh, as best as possible. So by making sure that when we chop the chicken uh, and we're chopping it all in even relatively even sizes, uh, we're not going to end up with uh, unevenly cooked chicken. So I'm going for about one inch pieces here, so this is relatively close. Uh, and, uh, yeah, about one inch pieces or so. Uh, what's really tricky about chicken breast, though, unlike chicken thigh actually, uh, is that chicken breast has point, it is shaped like a breast, the breast of a chicken, which means that it tapers off at the end. Uh, so we want to be very, very careful with the way that it tapers off uh, and make sure that we work around that taper so that we don't end up with thin stringy bits of chicken at the very, very end, which is not going to be fun. Alright, there's our chicken. Uh, I don't always make a huge fuss about cutting chicken. The main thing that I like to make sure that what we do uh, when we chop our raw meats is that we make sure uh, that I like to make sure that as best as I can at least uh, that the chicken, whenever we're chopping chicken, it happens last. So you know, we just chopped a bunch of veggies. Uh, all of those veggies that came before the chicken, that's really important. Otherwise, uh, you'll get in that world of being in danger of cross-contaminating stuff, uh, which is not really good. 
Uh, save yourself some trouble uh, and chop that chicken very, very last. We have the same stove, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, this is a really plain stove. <laughs> I don't know anything about this stove, to be honest. I'm a renter, what can I say? All right, so next up, so this is our chicken breast. We're all done chopping this stuff up. Uh, and then we're gonna do a really basic marinade. This is not gonna get too complicated with our marinade uh, because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in our sauce already. So I've not particularly found uh, in this dish that it's super necessary to do too much to the marinade. Uh, I'm just starting off that's four tablespoons of soy sauce. That's gonna be real fundamental. Uh, and then I'm gonna add, this is gonna be two tablespoons of Shaoxing wine. Uh, which is going to give it a little bit of brightness, but mostly what's going to happen is the acidity from our Shaoxing wine. Uh, it's going to help tenderize the meat a little bit. Uh, and then, ooh, I don't have sesame oil. What I should be doing is adding a tablespoon of sesame oil, but I ran out of sesame oil and I forgot to buy more. So here we are. The, so the last thing, or the second to last thing that I'm going to add, this is going to be a half a teaspoon of white pepper. Uh, and if you've watched any of these streams before, you'll know that that right there, what we just did, uh, is kind of our standby go-to uh, chicken marinade that I use in a lot of recipes pretty much any time that I don't know what else to do in a marinade uh, because they work really well. They're like a lot of really fundamental uh, things that will go uh, and sort of pair with umami really well. So I'm gonna toss this to combine, and then we're gonna let this sit. Uh, if you're really committed, this should be marinating for at least 30 minutes. It is, it might, it might go for 30 minutes, let's time it. Uh, what I found lately, I've timed it recently, and it usually ends up being about 10, 15 minutes. So we'll see. <coughs> so that's setting aside. Uh, and then next up, we're, we're gonna do, oh, we have two more things to do. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is our sauce we're gonna leave. Uh, and the second thing that we're going to do is our tempura batter. So let's take a look at our sauce first. So I'm going to start with our sauce. The sauce element, as I mentioned before, uh, relies very heavily on one single ingredient, which is pineapple syrup. So if you're not familiar with pineapple syrup, uh, I mentioned this earlier too. Uh, pineapple syrup, it comes up in a lot of cocktails. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to use the syrup that our pineapple is canned in. So this is literally just canned pineapple. Uh, but if you make lots of cocktails, you will also know uh, that because pineapple syrup, it comes up in so many cocktails all the time. I believe it is used in Mai Tais. I might be wrong about that. I'm pretty sure it is used in Mai Tais though. Um, because it comes up in cocktails so often, you can also just buy pineapple syrup independently. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it, it sold it, it just sold bottled. Uh, I have also seen it sold canned a lot too. Uh, but what I'm more familiar with, what I know pineapple syrup for, uh, is it's the syrup or the liquid that canned pineapple is canned in. So when you buy canned pineapple, uh, it comes in a can and it's usually soaking in some amount of water or liquid, uh, which is this stuff. So that's that's the pineapple syrup. So if you make cocktails, that syrup really, really useful. Uh, maybe even more valuable than the pineapple itself, uh, which is canned pineapple, not my super favorite. Uh, usually if I'm using pineapple in the stir fry, my preference is to use uh, frozen pineapple, but uh, we gotta use this canned stuff up. So here we are. So uh, in my opinion, this might be maybe the most important thing that we use in our sauce today uh, because it's where all of that really iconic sweetness is gonna come from. So, uh, so we're gonna use, this is gonna be half a cup of pineapple syrup. Which I'm gonna try not to spill. Uh, if you like your sweet and sour chicken to be particularly sweet, uh, use more of it. Uh, I particularly like to tone down uh, the sweetness of pretty much everything that I cook. Um, so we're gonna dial it back just a little bit, so that's just half a cup. I know that I've seen lots of recipes that use like almost a whole cup of this stuff, so um, adjust to your taste. Uh, then next up, so we're gonna continue down the line with all of our sweet elements. So this is gonna be four tablespoons of sweet chili sauce, which is uh, something that I have gotten in the habit of using uh, every time that I'm losing or like giving up certain qualities of sugar. So I have seen a lot of recipes uh, just call for straight white sugar, so like just straight up baking sugar. Um, 
I find very often you will see me you like holding back a lot of sugar and then adding uh, sweet chili sauce quite a bit. I think it's like a really interesting quality of sweetness that's uh, maybe a little bit more complex and maybe a little bit more in depth of flavor uh, than just plain old sugar. Elevated, yeah, cool, yeah, thank you. Ooh. Cool, all right, so next up, uh, this is gonna be two tablespoons, just two tablespoons of ketchup. So uh, someone also asked me this earlier where like the origins of ketchup in Chinese food comes from. Uh, it is unequivocally, it absolutely comes from uh, American cooking. So every time that I have ever come across ketchup, uh, it's because of some American invention, and that's how it ends up in Chinese food. So. Uh, it is also, if you've ever come across sweet and sour chicken, uh, sweet and sour chicken has a very specific color to it. It is like bright, so red that it's it's like inhumanely red. It's like the color red that like only comes from a canned or jarred thing. Uh, and that color, it's coming from the ketchup. So we're only using two tablespoons of ketchup today. Uh, I've seen a lot of recipes that call for like half a cup or more of ketchup. Um, so if you're particularly attached to that color, uh, use dial up that ketchup more. Uh, I particularly am trying to dial back that ketchup so we're holding back a little bit, uh, but adjust to your liking. All right, so next up is the sour in our sweet and sour chicken. This is gonna be a whole four tablespoons or a quarter cup of rice vinegar. So that's where all of the sourness of our uh, dish comes from, which it, to me is a lot of sour. Uh, so that's a whole quarter cup, but surprisingly as I've like cooked this dish more, uh, I discovered that even though if you even if you add a quarter cup of uh, sauce, a quarter cup of vinegar to a sauce like this, uh, it's actually not quite as aggressive as you think. Uh, not in the way of like when you add a quarter cup of like, rice vinegar to a soup, which doesn't really do much. It pretty much just stays in the soup, uh, and then you essentially just end up eating that rice vinegar. Uh, with a sauce like this, you can add that much rice vinegar, uh, and what's going to happen is a lot of the acidity of that rice vinegar is going to cook off. Uh, so you're not going to get quite as much of that aggressiveness of, sweet, of, of uh, sourness that's coming off uh, in the way that you might actually come across that if you did. Uh, so it, what it actually reminds me of is the sweet and sour, uh, hot, hot and sour soup uh, that we did a little while ago, uh, which is like very sour. It was, it was very sour because that rice vinegar didn't really have a chance to really burn off any acidity. Uh, so it's very forward. It's right in your face. Is that it? So that, uh, the last two things that we're going to add, so that was uh, four tablespoons of soy sauce. Uh, and then this is going to be just two tablespoons of doubanjang or Chinese uh, fermented chili paste. So this is going to give us a little bit of heat, um, which is maybe not necessarily characteristic of this particular dish. Uh, but I actually think that it works a little bit better. And it sort of like dials back or cuts down on uh, some of that like sickly sweet qualities that you come across. Uh, when you eat sweet and sour chicken. Uh, last thing I'm adding, that's going to be a pinch of salt, and we're going to mix this up. Uh, and that's our sauce. I guess we should taste it. That is very sweet. Add a little bit more salt. Yeah, that's a little bit better. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so the last thing that we're going to assemble here before we head over to the stove uh, is going to be our tempura batter. So uh, what I love about the tempura batter, and this has actually been something that I've been using a lot lately, uh, is that it doesn't require any bread. It just makes it really, really simple. Uh, so if you're new to deep frying or if you're just being lazy, uh, the tempura batter is a really, really great uh, solution to just making deep frying a little bit easier because you don't have to do too much uh, extra work. So uh, the reason for that is, is because it is very specifically a batter. It's not a breading. Uh, so in a lot of like fried chicken recipes, uh, especially like American fried chicken recipes, you'll see three, uh, two different stations. So you'll see a wet station. Sometimes that'll be like egg. Uh, sometimes that might be like buttermilk, stuff like that. Uh, it will be that, that on one side will be the wet station. On the other side will be the dry station. So you'll have flour uh, and you dip it in the wet, then you dip it in the dry and you have to do one piece at a time, which is 
um, laborious and kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, so what I love about the tempura batter is that we can pretty much skip that because it's a batter, it's not a breading. So we're going to uh, combine our batter uh, and then just toss the chicken in and that's pretty much it. So starting off, this is our dry. So this is a quarter cup each, that's AP flour. It's a little bit of cornstarch, same amount of cornstarch. And the same amount of, and this is maybe the most important part, uh, soda water. Uh, and you'll see soda water come up in a lot of tempura batters uh, because what's going to happen is, is that as we start uh, tossing that tempura batter, uh, that's going to start coming together. This is some uh, Im immersion blended egg, by the way, which we have left over from the food booth. Uh, so what's going to happen is that, that carbonation that's in that soda water uh, is going to start uh, creating a lot of air pockets, which is going to be really, really nice because it's going to create a little bit of extra fluffiness uh, to our batter. Yeah. So I'm gonna whisk this up. We're gonna wait. And we're gonna whisk until we have a nice smooth batter forming. Uh, and right now, I'm really just looking to break up all of those large lumps and clumps so that we don't have any weird, uh, awkward pieces of flour kind of hanging around. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna get back to our chicken, which as I mentioned earlier, uh, should be marinating for at least 30 minutes. It did not marinate for 30 minutes. We went for about 10 minutes, which is gonna be fine. Uh, but what's most important about our chicken today uh, is that we wanna try and hold back as much of the liquid in our marinade as possible, uh, because that's going to start diluting our batter more and more. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm adding my chicken, but I'm being careful to hold back uh, as much of what's what that liquid that's sitting at the bottom of my marinade here. Um, so that we don't end up diluting our batter and then we get uh, more of a loose batter and then we're not going to get as much cohesiveness and fluffiness. So if you're really committed, you might even strain this stuff off. I'm not going to bother because, uh, well, I'm lazy. Uh, and there's our residual liquid. So then I'm going to give the, all of this a toss. that how to do it. Come on back. There you are. All right. So that's our tempura batter. We're going to head over to the stove actually and start cooking. Yeah. All right, so over on the stove, I've got my fryer heating up. Uh, we're at 380, which is a little bit hotter than I'd like it to be. Uh, and so what we're gonna do today is a double fry, which is my favorite way of frying chicken because it gets us the crispiest possible piece of fried chicken that I've ever accomplished. Uh, and so essentially what we're gonna do is we're going to fry our chicken for the first fry uh, at a little bit of a lower temperature, which is why I mentioned that I feel like that fryer is a little bit hotter than I'd like it to be. Uh, I'd like it to be circling closer to like 360. Uh, when we go in for our second fry, we're gonna have that be up closer to 375 or so. Uh, and that, that second fry is gonna be where we get really, really crispy pieces of fried chicken. Uh, but by doing that first fry at a little bit of a lower heat, uh, what's gonna happen is it's gonna pull out a lot of that moisture. So uh, when we add that chicken back for the second fry, uh, the fryer oil is expending its energy on frying the chicken rather than uh, cooking off moisture. So uh, when you hear like all of, when something hits the fryer and it starts sizzling really aggressively, uh, that's the sound of the fryer oil burning off moisture, which is uh, important, but also it's going to detract from the crispiness of the chicken. chicken. So uh, by letting that happen on the first fry and then removing it, reheating the oil and then doing it again, uh, that moisture is not present in that second fry, which gives us a crispier piece of fried chicken. Uh, that is as far as I understand the science behind the double fry. I did not invent this method though, so uh, don't quote me on that. All right, here's our chicken going in for its first batch. I usually like to limit this to about 10 to 12 pieces of time, uh, which usually ends up being about two batches. Uh, 
All right, so there's our first batch into the fryer. We're gonna let that go for about a minute or so. Uh, not very long. It's actually not gonna fry for a particularly long amount of time um, because we're not really trying to cook the chicken at this point. So um, uh, the chicken is mostly just burning off moisture here. So what we're gonna do is we're waiting for the chicken to set, uh, waiting for that batter to set. That usually takes about a minute. Uh, and then we're going to pull it out. So when we pull it out, uh, that chicken is still going to be very undercooked, which is by far definitely our goal here. So we don't want the chicken to be fully cooked at this point. Uh, otherwise, when it gets back into the fryer for the second cook, uh, it's going to overcook, which is not fun. If you've ever had overcooked fried chicken, it's not attractive. So I'm keeping a close eye on the temperature of my fryer oil here. We're dropping all the way down to 320, which is okay for our first fry. Uh, but we want to keep an eye on that and make sure that it reheats before we go back in for our second fry. All right, here's my first batch coming out. Uh, as you can probably see, yeah, I think you can see, uh, the chicken is very pale. It's got more of a white color to it. Uh, this would not be an attractive piece of fried chicken to try and eat right now. All right, so over on my cutting board, I have a drying rack set up, and here is our first fry. And we're gonna set these down. Uh, we uh, this is not necessarily mandatory. I don't always remember to take the dryer rack out. Uh, but what I like to do is make sure that this chicken, it's not sitting flat on a bowl or a plate like we have it right now. Uh, uh, because what, I, what will happen is wherever it is sitting down, uh, so the side that it's laying down on, it's going to continue to sit uh, in whatever oil that it happens to be sitting in, which is not good because uh, that's on your way to a soggy piece of fried chicken. So. Uh, we've got this on the dryer rack. We're going to let it cool for about five minutes or so. Uh, usually I go for the duration of time that it takes for the second batch of chicken to go. So here's our second batch going in. Uh, and once again, our fryer, it's at a lower temperature. So we're at three, we're at 340 right now, which is a pretty good temperature for our first fry. So there's our second fry going in. And we're gonna let that go for another about two minutes or so. Yeah. Cool. Hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley, this is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST. Uh, with new recipes out over on the YouTube channel every Friday. So today we're doing a recipe uh, that came out on the channel last Friday, which is a sweet and sour chicken, which we're going to do uh, with a double fried tempura batter, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free and drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know everything about frying chicken, but I know lots of stuff, so hopefully I can be helpful. Uh, or informative, or at the very least, entertaining to watch. That's the goal. It's just be entertaining. Uh, uh, as always, if you haven't yet, definitely, if you're watching on Reddit, hop over to the YouTube channel and check out what's going on over there. Lots of fun new content that's coming out every Friday. So if you want to help us hit our goal, we're working our way up to 4,500 subscribers by the end of the month. So uh, if you want to help us hit that goal, please hop over and subscribe. Lots of fun content coming up every Friday. Yeah, it's a little bit early. Yeah. So here's our second batch coming out. Once again, very pale. Uh, not the color of chicken that we want. I'm actually going to go ahead and do our third batch. Uh, and our fryer is at a decent temperature, so I'm not too worried about reheating it at this point. 
Uh, we are still floating at closer to 320, 330, uh, which is okay for our first fry. Uh, for our second fry, though, we definitely want this oil to be much, much hotter. Is our last batch going in. Uh, and while that's going, we're going to pop back over and get this chicken on the dry rack. So just like with our first batch, I'm making sure that all of this is not sitting uh, on any flat surface because wherever it is laying down it's going to start getting soggy which is not going to be good. Uh, and then we're going to let all of this cool down for usually I like to let it go for about five minutes uh, and basically what we're trying to do is by the time that we get the second batch in batch uh, back into the fryer probably the next batch is going to be ready to fry that's usually what I aim for. Cool. All right, so we're gonna let that go maybe another maybe another minute or two uh, and then we'll start uh, going moving on to our second fry. Uh, by the way, if you have never fried chicken in a wok before, I recently tried, uh, well I actually always fry stuff in woks, uh, but I recently experimented a little bit with a Dutch oven and discovered all of the reasons why I don't like frying chicken in a Dutch oven. Uh, what I love about frying in a, fr uh, in a wok uh, is that just like when you're stir frying in a wok, the wok has the ability to change temperature very quickly. Uh, so if your fryer is getting too hot, you can turn the, oil, the temperature of the fire down uh, and the wok will respond. So the oil temperature of the oil will come down uh, as you turn the fire down. Now, uh, if you do that in a Dutch oven, uh, the same thing will not happen because a Dutch oven has a lot of heat retention. So what's going to happen uh, if you turn the fire down while you're deep frying in a Dutch oven is this just going to stay hot for at least another five minutes. Uh, because that Dutch oven is retaining all of the heat, so uh, which is useful and unuseful depending on what you're looking for. Um, but if you happen to notice that your fryer oil is way too hot and things are burning, uh, it's going to be a real pain in the ass if you're in a Dutch oven because it's going to take about five minutes before that thing starts cooling down again, which is annoying. All right. So here's our second batch of fried chicken coming out of the fry, actually the third batch. Uh, and then we're gonna, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna, two things happen. So the first thing that we wanna do before we start uh, frying our second batch of chicken is make sure that that fryer temperature uh, comes way back up. So we're floating around 300, which is way, way too low. So for our second fry, uh, we need that oil to be closer to 375. I'm gonna shoot for closer to 380. Uh, and that's going to make sure that our chicken stays nice and crispy uh, because it's not going to be nearly as uh, long of a time in the fryer. We're going to let this thing go for maybe a minute or two uh, and then immediately pull it out. We're out of dryer rack space. What do we want to do? Should have gotten a bigger dryer rack. Oh well. Yeah, it'll be okay. Okay. So back over on the stove, let's take a look. Uh, what I usually like to do, I don't always do this, but uh, when I remember to do it, uh, what I like to do is make sure and fish out all of that debris, which is not a good thing to leave sitting around. Uh, all of this debris that's hanging out in our fryer right now, especially around the thermometer. Um, this is going to start burning if you leave it in. So what I like to do is make sure that we pull all of that stuff out uh, before we start our second fry uh, so that it doesn't end up burning. So 
So I'm going to fish out all of this debris here. <coughs> uh, and what will happen is if you leave this stuff in, uh, it doesn't always happen, but if you're unlucky, uh, what will happen is it's going to start sticking to whatever the next thing that you fry is. Which is not going to be good uh, because it's also going to continue to cook. And then what you're going to end up with uh, is some very burnt pieces of tempura batter, which is not fun. All right, so I'm gonna fish all that stuff out and then we're gonna let that fryer come back up to temperature we're sitting at 330. We're gonna wait for about 375 or so and then we're gonna start for our second fry. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, back over here, we have our chicken cooling down. Uh, so the big key element to any double fry uh, is that it's gotta cool down before the next fry. Uh, so over here, this is our first batch right here. So the first 12 that were on the left side uh, we're going to add this batch back to the fryer first uh, and that's going to give the rest of this chicken the most opportunity to dry off uh, while we work on uh, cooking our first batch. Kevin, yeah, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, we will, uh, we will work too. Lots of people call, call me Wu, which is fine. Also a little weird, but you could call me Wu. That's fine. All right. So I'm going to pick up the first 12. I usually like to count uh, to make sure that we're not over overloading our fryer and let's head back over to the cell all right we're floating at 360 I'd like that to be a little bit hotter so I'm gonna let that go for another minute yeah cool cool hello to everyone just tuning in my name is Wesley this is Wu Can Cook uh, if you've never caught one of these streams before, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST. Uh, today we're doing a sweet and sour chicken, which is based off of a recipe that I had written uh, over on my YouTube channel last Friday. So every Friday we've got new recipes coming up. Uh, this Friday coming up is going to be, by the way, what are we cooking this Friday? Uh, oh, we're doing string bean chicken, which is going to be really fun. Uh, we're adding a couple of uh, fun stir fries to the, to the recipes. Uh, of late, which is nice because those are all things that I like to eat for dinner. So we can start cooking those things for dinner, which is great. Uh, so if you're interested in following along uh, with recipes like that, definitely find your way over to the YouTube channel uh, and check out what's going on over there. Lots of fun new content popping up every Friday. All right. So here's our first batch of chicken going back into the wok. Uh, we're up at 380 degrees, which is much, much hotter than our first batch. Uh, and one thing that you might notice happening is that the fryer oil is going to sizzle quite a bit less. It's still going to sizzle, uh, but not quite as much, and that's because there's not quite as much uh, water in the chicken anymore. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to let this go at the higher temperature for about, maybe about two minutes. Uh, and what we're looking for at this point is a nice deep golden brown. Uh, so we don't want that pale color colored chicken anymore. Uh, we want that stuff to be ripping hot uh, and deeply golden. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what I also like to do is make sure that this stuff doesn't clump up to either. It happens uh, quite a bit, especially if your fryer oil is a little bit lower, uh, which ours is today because we're running out of fryer oil, which is not good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, this is looking good. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again too. So this is also the same reason why it's really important uh, when you're deep frying chicken to make sure that that chicken is chopped inappropriately or similarly sized pieces of chicken. Uh, is that once that fryer starts bubbling, it's hard to keep an eye on making sure uh, that that chicken isn't overcooking. So you can't quite uh, pull you know, singular pieces of chicken out of the fryer anymore because you can't see them all. So uh, that's really useful to make sure that your chicken is all chopped in the same size and shape. Uh, otherwise, stuff will absolutely start overcooking, which is not good. All right. First batch coming out of the second fry.
Uh, and then here's my second batch going in. The temperature, yeah, we're at about 360. Once again, we're adding, this should be about 12 pieces at a time. Well, we can pop that over here and look at our finished chicken. So here's our finished pieces of chicken coming out of the fryer. Oh, cool. Yeah, you saw the post on gift recipes. Yeah, gift recipes have been super fun. I love posting stuff on gift recipes. All right, here's our first batch of chicken. It is much, much more golden brown. Uh, then you'll notice so here's our first fry here's our second fry uh, it is a lot more golden brown than that first fry uh, which is very intentional we want that first fry to be very undercooked so that we can uh, get a more deeply golden brown color on our second fry right, here's our second batch going already we're about 80 percent there Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I've been posting stuff on gift recipes a lot lately. For like pretty much, almost I think like over a year now, which is fun. That's basically the YouTube channel started on gift recipes. Uh, so that's why if you scroll far back enough on the YouTube channel, uh, you'll eventually just find the gift recipes that I was putting out in the early days, uh, which is always fun and a little bit uh, embarrassing because it was like the early stuff I had not really figured out how to color, uh, like color correct food. Uh, so it's like a little bit pale. Sometimes it's a little bit orange. Uh, saturation's a little bit off, stuff like that, so. While I was still figuring out how to run a food channel, not a music channel. All right, so our second batch, I'm keeping a close eye, just like the first batch, I'm keeping a close eye uh, because we can't quite see what color the chicken is, especially when it's bubbling really aggressively like it is right now. Uh, so I'm pulling these out. Uh, pretty frequently just to keep an eye on whether or not it's overcooking. So if you've ever had overcooked fried chicken, it's not fun. We don't want that to happen. Ever. There's nothing quite as disappointing as overcooked fried chicken. Alright, let's pull you out. So before we add our final batch back to the wok, I'm noticing that my fryer is running a little bit cold, so I'd like that to reheat. We're floating around 350 right now, uh, which should probably be fine, but I'd like it to be closer to 370 or so. Uh, so I'm going to pull this out of our wok, and we're going to get this fry or drying out, uh, and wait just a minute or two before we add our second batch or final batch back to the wok, uh, so that we're not necessarily making sure that we're not frying. Uh, on an underheated fryer, which is going to get us soggy fried chicken, which is not fun. The only thing more disappointing than overcooked fried chicken is soggy fried chicken, which is uh, also really disappointing. Cool. So once again, we could take a look. Here's our finished fried chicken. You can see it's dramatically different color than the uh, first fry. So here's our first fry, which is very, very pale. Uh, this first fry was cooked at maybe, I think, 350, maybe 320, 310 or so, uh, 300F, right around there. Uh, this second fry was cooked on a second time uh, at 380, 380, 375F or so. Uh, and that second uh, fry, because it's much, much hotter, is giving us a much darker and more crispy color. Uh, but more importantly, because we fried it the first time, uh, all of the moisture gets pulled out of the chicken while we do this first fry, so that when we go back and do our second fry, uh, the fryer oil is spending its energy on frying the chicken and getting crispy fried chicken, rather than spending its energy on burning off moisture, which is not what we're after. We want our fryer to be using its energy to frying the chicken, not burning moisture. Yeah. All right. Get our final batch going. All right, let's do it. 
So our fryer back over on the stove is at floating right around 380, which is my sweet spot. I like that. Um, we're gonna drop this chicken back into the wok and let this go for another about two minutes or so. There it goes. So we're gonna let that go. That will go for another about two to three minutes uh, and that should do it. Cool. Yeah, these are looking pretty good. I'd like that to go for maybe another minute. Uh, and then we should be ready to eat, actually. Yeah. Uh, so just like I mentioned earlier, because it's really, really difficult to see the color of the chicken, uh, I'm pulling pieces out uh, pretty constantly to make sure that we're not overcooking the chicken. Uh, but because all of this uh, fryer is, the fryer is bubbling very, very aggressively, it's hard to really see what color the chicken is, which is uh, really difficult or really important we're trying to make sure not to overcook our chicken. Yeah. There we go. Looking good. All right, one more time. Here's our finished fried chicken. Here's our third batch of our finished fried chicken, which once again we are adding to a dryer rack uh, to make sure that nothing gets soggy while it dries. That ought to do it. All right, finally, when we back heading back over to the stove, uh, we are going to very, very carefully remove our fryer oil. So when I say very carefully, I mean very, very carefully remove that fryer oil. Fryer oil, uh, unlike a pot of boiling water, is very, very dangerous because unlike a pot of boiling water, a boiling pot of boiling water will burn you and then stop burning. Fryer oil will burn you and then continue to burn you. So, be really careful when you pour out your fryer oil, because it's very scary. Uh, and then what I like to do, so you don't have to do this, especially if you don't have a round bottom wok. So this is a wok ring. Uh, you will see me using a wok ring pretty much any time that I'm deep frying, uh, any time that I'm slow cooking, or any time that I'm doing something where I want to absolutely make sure uh, that the wok doesn't move around. Uh, you don't have to use a wok ring, but uh, I highly recommend it because without that wok ring, uh, you'll notice that my wok uh, rolls around a lot because the bottom of the wok is round. So uh, that wok ring, it tends to be really useful if you're worried about the wok sort of like flopping around, which is uh, real scary if you're doing things like deep frying. Uh, what I do also do though, uh, because I don't, I'm not a particularly huge fan of stir frying with a wok ring though, uh, because I find that it sort of just gets in the way. Uh, what I like to do is remove the wok ring when we're ready to stir fry. Uh, that's why I just pulled that wok ring off of the stove uh, so that we can start our stir fry. Uh, and then what I'm going to do right now, or what I'm doing right now, uh, is I'm just wiping off all of this excess debris. So this uh, debris that's hanging behind, that's all just like the stuff that was burning or just like staying behind every time that we deep fry, which is like all this junk. That's not really stuff that we need to s stick around. 
because uh, that's just going to end up like dirtying up our sauce, which is not going to be good. So I got my wok back over on the stove. We're going to let that thing reheat. Uh, and meanwhile, we're going to do one more thing that I always forget to do. Uh, so we're going to assemble our cornstarch slurry. So cornstarch slurry, just like the name implies, uh, is a slurry of cornstarch. Uh, what's most important about a cornstarch slurry is how much cornstarch that you're using. So usually for a stir fry, uh, I like to use about two tablespoons. Uh, and then the quantity of water is not nearly as important. You could really uh, kind of just eyeball it. That's what I do a lot. Uh, what we're really just trying to make sure is that that cornstarch that we just added uh, is not in solid form anymore. So we don't want to be doing uh, is adding solid cornstarch to a stir fry because cornstarch uh, is going to start gumming up. It's going to like stick to things. Uh, so we want to make sure that that cornstarch doesn't stick to stuff. Uh, and what we do that by dissolving it in water before we add it to our sauce. All right. So back over on the stove, we've got all this nice uh, heat coming off of our wok. So what we're going to do, uh, so uh, what we're going to do here is, is that before we start our stir fry, the first thing that we want to do is reduce the sauce. So this is really, really important. And what I've discovered uh, is maybe the most important part about frying or doing anything that requires fried chicken. Uh, so that sauce, before we add that sauce back to our wok uh, and combine it with the fried chicken, uh, the sauce itself must be reduced. So if you don't reduce that sauce before you add the chicken in, uh, what you'll end up doing is reducing the sauce while the chicken is in the wok, which is not what we're after because what will happen is if you do that, uh, then this chicken is going to start boiling and that's how you turn it. It doesn't matter how crispy your fried chicken is. Uh, if you don't remember to reduce that sauce, uh, you're going to boil the fried chicken and then you're going to have squishy and like mushy fried chicken uh, because it just boiled in a whole bunch of sauce for like, it doesn't matter even if you do it for like 30, 45 seconds, uh, that's still long enough in order to achieve uh, glo glo uh, gloopy fried chicken, which is not fun. <clears throat> so what we want to do is before we fry that chicken, the first thing that we want to do is reduce our sauce. Uh, and then once we have this thick and like glaze like texture to our sauce, uh, then we can do move on to uh, combining our stir fry. <clears throat> so up first, I'm not actually going to do our aromatics first. So this is going to be our sauce going in first. Uh, followed by our cornstarch slurry. Uh, and then I'm just going to give this a quick toss to combine. And um, what I'm paying attention to here is I'm just looking for uh, that really thick and cohesive texture to our sauce. So we want uh, really like a uh, glaze like texture. Right now it's very loose and like liquidy. That's not what we're after. So what we're trying to do is get this sauce to reduce. Uh, to the point where we have a nice thick glaze. Uh, and then once we have that thick glaze, we can go ahead and pull it out. Uh, and then that's going to be the sauce that we coat the chicken in. So we're not actually going to be uh, doing any of this reduction uh, once stuff is in the wok. We want to be doing that now uh, while the wok is empty so that we're not boiling anything. There we go. This is coming together nicely. All right, it's looking good. So there's my sauce. I'm pulling it out of our wok. Uh, and then I'm going to give this a quick rinse. Then we're reheating our wok and we're going to start our stir fry next. Jenny, Jenny, yeah, how's it going? Sorry, did I just read your name wrong? Jenny. Sorry. I don't know why I assumed that said Jenny. All right, so I'm wiping down all of this gunk from our wok, and we're going to start our stir fry. Uh, meanwhile, while that wok reheats, we can take a look at our sauce. So here's what's going on. Uh, so what we just did is before we started cooking our, our chicken, uh, we reduced our sauce into a glaze. So you'll notice that our sauce 
uh, has this nice thick uh, glaze like texture so if we had uh, tried to reduce that sauce while things were in the wok uh, which is oftentimes something that you might do in a lot of stir fries is definitely something that you'll do in like a curry for example uh, we don't want to do that with a dish like this because what will happen uh, is you're going to end up boiling the chicken which is not fun we don't want to boil anything at this point no boiling please <clears throat> all right let's get into our stir fry uh, this is about four tablespoons of peanut oil whoops and our long yao and here's my garlic going in first followed by my ginger oh, whoops don't do that uh, and then we're going to give this a toss until it becomes fragrant that usually uh, for me is about 10 seconds but use your nose at this point Uh, and, then, <clears throat> and then first I'm going to add my veggies first, so here's my onions and my celery going in. Uh, and I mentioned this at the start of the stream too, but uh, both of these veggies, they're very delicate, so they're not going to be in our wok for too long. Uh, we don't want them to be hanging around for too long because otherwise they'll basically just disintegrate. Uh, both onions and celery, they're mostly made up of water, so we don't want uh, these things to cook for too long. Otherwise, uh, we're going to lose them. They're just going to disappear, which is not fun. Uh, so what I'm looking to do right now is I'm just trying to cook off a little bit of the rawness. Uh, we don't want to be uh, cooking or eating raw celery or raw onions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Jenny, thank you. Yeah. I always love when people love the recipe. I always love when people try the recipes. I like seeing when other people try them. Uh, so if you are, by the way, if anyone does try the recipes, uh, please take photos and send them to me. I love to see, I love seeing the uh, photos. Especially, I love seeing photos when people, especially when they're like, have to adapt the recipe because I know a lot of the stuff that we use, not everyone can find all these ingredients. So uh, I love to see what people do when they can't find ingredients. It's really interesting to me. All right, it's looking good. Try not to drop this. Uh, here's our chicken going back in. Uh, and once that chicken is in the wok, we're now on a real timer here uh, because we don't want to o overcook that chicken. Uh, so the last thing that I'm going to add uh, before adding our glaze is some pineapple. If I was paying attention, probably should measure that. I think that was about half a cup, but I forgot to measure it. Uh, and then finally, here's our sauce mixture going into the wok. And then we're going to give it a real quick toss. Uh, you'll notice that that chicken was really only in the wok for maybe under a minute even. Uh, that's a real goal. We really, What we really want to be trying to do uh, is make sure that the chicken it's not hanging out in the wok for too long. Uh, because the longer that it's in the wok while the heat is on, uh, the more that we're going to lose uh, the crispiness of our chicken. So we can take a look. Here's our finished chicken. So I was, you'll notice that I was working very quickly. I was very intentionally working very quickly. Uh, once that chicken gets in the wok, uh, it's on a timer. At that point, once the chicken's back in the wok, you have maybe a minute. Uh, after that, that chicken is gonna start cooking. Uh, and we never wanna be cooking fried chicken in a wok with moisture in it. Because if you start cooking a chicken in a fried chicken in a wok, uh, while there's also moisture in it, what's gonna happen is that stuff is gonna boil, which is not fun. Uh, once it's off heat like this, it will still technically uh, start losing crispiness at this point. Uh, there's really nothing that you can do once the, the chicken is in the serving bowl like this. Uh, it is eventually just going to start getting uh, losing moisture. Uh, and that's just the nature of fried chicken. Uh, but while we're on heat, that's when we're mostly most in danger of getting fried chicken, which is 
our biggest enemy. Uh, last thing that we're going to add is just going to be a pinch of sesame seed. Presentation matters, guys. chicken still very very crispy really tangy actually that that rice kind of pops out nicely uh, but the way that the chicken crisps up is very like well preserved uh, because it wasn't really in the wok for very long uh, which kind of allows the chicken to re retain all of that crispiness that we developed in the double fry uh, while also still like uh, being like thoroughly cooked through uh, which is real nice I love that I love this dish this is actually kind of growing on me I've never, I've never been like a really big fan of like sweet things uh, in Chinese food, so I've never been a huge fan of like sweet and sour chicken. Uh, not a really huge fan of like uh, honey sesame chicken, things that are like overly sweet. Uh, but I actually love this particular version because it's dialing back a lot of the sugary qualities while still like staying relatively true to uh, the nature of what this dish is supposed to be. So uh, one of, uh, one of, in my opinion, probably one of the more creative recipes that we've done on the series in you know, quite a while. Uh, and not necessarily. A lot of the stuff that we've been doing lately is just like really traditional Chinese food, uh, which is there's not really a lot of ways that you can adapt really traditional Chinese food uh, because it is what it is already. So like a tian, we did uh, we did um, a tian bing, which is a Chinese crepe. Uh, we also did uh, coming up is actually going to be um, a si fan, a fan tuan, which is like a Chinese rice roll. Uh, we also did gimbops recently. A lot of these things you can't really you can't really fuck with it that much uh, because there's, it was already very much established like what this dish is. Uh, whereas a lot of these Chinese dishes are like Chinese American dishes like this stuff. Uh, we can kind of mess around with it because there's not really like a like set and guaranteed way of like how this is supposed to look and feel and taste and stuff. So uh, one of my favorite ways of doing fried chicken lately. Cool. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. If you haven't yet, definitely bop over to the YouTube channel if you're looking for the recipe that's already over there. Uh, those are out every Friday. So this particular recipe we came out with last Friday, uh, and we did the uh, that was over on the YouTube yet yeah, last Friday, uh, which is coming out every Friday. So next Friday coming up, we have a string bean chicken recipe uh, that's going to be super fun. Uh, I believe I believe the string, string bean chicken is a Panda Express hack. I think that's adding to our Panda Express hack series. Uh, which we haven't added to in a while, so that's going to be really, really fun. Uh, what are we doing? After that, we're doing a fan tuan, which is a Chinese rice roll. Uh, and then after that, I believe, is going to be a Thai dish called a lob gai, uh, which is uh, like a like meat lettuce wrap, I guess. That's like a lettuce, a lettuce wrap, I guess that's what you would call it. Uh, so lots of stuff like that popping up over on the YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're watching, especially if you're watching on Reddit, that's the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, definitely hop over to the channel and check out what's going on over there. Uh, in addition to all the recipe videos, that's also where our second live stream lives. So 
Uh, if you're looking for a schedule of everything that we're going to be cooking that already lives over there, so the folks who are watching over on YouTube uh, knew quite a while ago that we would be cooking this because it was in a schedule a long time ago. So. Uh, we're working our way over up to 4,500 subs by the end of the month, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, uh, please hop over and subscribe. Uh, what are we doing? So tomorrow is Tuesday. Tomorrow we're going to be doing a crispy bacon fried rice, which is actually like one of the most popular fried rice dishes that we do uh, in our food pop-up, which is called Who Can Cook. So by the way, if you're here in the Bay Area, uh, definitely look out for our food pop-up called Who Can Cook. We're at the Alameda Antiques Fair every uh, first Sunday uh, and second and fourth Saturdays at the Hayward Farmer's Market. Uh, and one of the more popular dishes that we've been doing is the crispy bacon fried rice, which comes from this YouTube series. Uh, so we're going to be doing that one live tomorrow. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is, so I picked up some, what we recently started doing in uh, the food pop-up, uh, we picked up some uh, fresh flour tortillas. Uh, and what we're going to do is a quick uh, crema uh, and a um, uh, pickled shallot. Uh, and we're going to wrap that into a burrito. Uh, and that has been like one of the really popular things that we've been serving in the food booth of late. So uh, that's all coming up tomorrow. All right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, def Jenny, definitely find your way over to the fair. Uh, that, it, that's been a really popular one. Uh, we've been doing that uh, every first Sunday uh, at, in Alameda and then second and fourth Saturdays in Hayward. Uh, if you're looking for more about that, I guess I should always link this stuff. Uh, if you're looking for more information, uh, that lives over on the homepage, which is at wukancook.com slash eats. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for, so much for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow doing crispy bacon fried rice, uh, and I'll see you guys soon. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll be here doing dishes, uh, and uh, I'll try and make sure I watch for more questions. All right. Thanks, all. See you soon.